Well, good morning. Can y'all hear me out there? Can you hear me? You can hear me out there? Good, good. I couldn't, I couldn't tell, but I'm glad you can because we're ready to start. We're here to worship the Lord this morning. There's a lot going on in our world right now, isn't there? But we serve a mighty God who isn't surprised by any of it. And whether this is, um, whether this is the time that, that things start the end and we go to be with Jesus and, you know, the world goes crazy or whether we have a hundred more years, it's a good time to worship him, to get close to him and to be real serious about what our job is while we're here. And that's making sure that everybody knows that, that they have the opportunity for eternal life through Jesus. So let's stand together and, and just give him all of our worship and praise. You are here moving in a mist. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. Are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. Yes, I worship you, cause you are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God Never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 That is who you are.
watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling. should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not His mercies, mercies for you?
with trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Father, stand before today we just gather today and we proclaim that you are Lord of all Lord we thank you that you are sovereign that everything that happens to us is not an accident but you know it ahead of time Lord we thank you for the cross we thank you for redeeming us to yourself Lord thank you that you call us sinners to just come home to you Lord thank you that you meet us right where we are and Lord, this morning, we just lift up your holy and righteous name, and we praise you. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you have placed us in this time for this purpose, to be your light and salt in a dark world. Lord, we join together with our brothers and sisters across the globe, and we lift up the people of Ukraine. God, we just pray that you will reign. Lord, that you will work miracles, that you will do things that only you can do, Lord. We thank you that you have evil within a boundary, that evil does move on this planet, but Lord, you have it within a boundary, and we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. And we pray that your spirit would move, that you would open up our hearts and minds to truth, the truth of your word, that we would rest in your Holy Spirit, that we would rest in peace knowing that our future is secure in you. And Lord, we just pray that you would move us to do your work, that you would break us of the things that hold us back, the idols that we hold in our lives, Lord. We lay them down at your feet, Father, and we pray that your spirit would move and that you would equip us to do your work. We thank you for this day that we freely gather together and proclaim you as Lord of all. We love you, Jesus, and we worship you. In his name we pray, amen. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. For, uh, for you guys that came out for the work day yesterday... I'm, I'm noticing some of you old guys are walking a little bent over, but um, I heard your, your time of fellowship was good. It's always good to, um, to help one another. Just a heads up, I don't know if you've forgotten or not, but today there is a, uh, there is a dinner and barbecue in the back in the fellowship hall after church for those of you who have been coming to church here for the past year or two, and you'd like an opportunity to get to know some of the leadership, the staff, our new pastor, um, please, please come out for that. You can, you can come, you can eat, you can leave, you can get to know us, but there's obviously no cost. We just want the opportunity to get to know you. So if you'd stay for that. And then we also also started a ministry a while back. Um, Will is Will. You want to stand up just so people can see you. This is Will Arius. He's um, he's he's an amazing guy that really loves the Lord. 
that came to know the Lord here some, how many years has it been now? Four years, Four years ago. And you know, the Bible says if anyone wouldn't be in Christ, there's a, they are a new creature. And what God's done in Will's life is, um, is a real miracle. And so he started this ministry with young people. We have uh, some skaters and boarders in our community that are looking for a place to do their thing. And so we're going to have them here in the church parking lot. I believe it's in the front one, right? And Will could use a little help. And 30, 40 years ago, I might have joined him. I'm not sure I'm that crazy. But if you'd like to give Will a hand with that ministry, he could use all the help he could get. You know, one of the things our current culture dislikes about us as Christians is that we have a tendency to judge what we believe and what the Bible says is wrong. And our culture wants us as Christians to give up on our convictions, what we hold true to believe from our hearts and believe to be just. They want to tell us it's just fine. Be fine with the new morality, the lawlessness that's taking place in our cities, and what our government is trying to teach our children. It's all fine. I'm fine. You're fine. They're fine. Why should we rock the boat? Because of what the Bible says, God's word about truth and justice. And the thing you need to know about the Holy Scriptures is that they're timeless. Governments may change. Nations will rise and fall. Culture changes. Some of you that have Your hair is about the color of mine. You can remember, you can go back and you can see how things have changed. But the Bible is changeless. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so is his word. It's timeless. The Old Testament prophets were called upon to pronounce God's judgment upon his people that were slowly forsaking his truth. In Matthew chapter 23, 13 through 39, Jesus spoke words of judgment and condemnation. He called the religious leaders out on what they were doing. He said it was wrong. Human beings are fundamentally not fine. We're broken. And we have a sin nature. And our judgmental spirit is just another manifestation of that reality. Pedophilia should be judged. So should murder and rape. And those who are trying to commit crimes against humanity as being done today in the nation of Ukraine and a people that want their freedom. And when freedom comes under attack, it's an attack against us all. There's this thing in our big cities right now called snatch and grab. I guess they're trying to clean that up a little bit because the Bible calls it stealing. And God's word says it should be judged. It's wrong. It's always been wrong. It's one of the commandments. And regardless of what kind of government you live under and where it is in the world, we all hold those commandments to be true. The question that faces us in life is not whether we should judge, but how we should judge. And the short book of Zephaniah is full of judgment, which is probably why most of us haven't spent much time in it. But even as God's love is certain, so is his judgment to those who would turn their back on him. And the Jews of Judah had done 
just that. And it speaks, it's so relative to us today because so many people have turned their backs on God and his standard for living. So if you'll open your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 1, we're going to go through the book this morning, a whole three chapters. Let's start with verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai. Cushai is actually an African name. Some of the scholars I read believe that he may have had some African descent. Jedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Zephaniah, what he's doing here is tracing his ancestry all the way back to one of the best kings that um, Israel or Judah ever had, and that was Hezekiah. The nation of Judah had been doing well under, under Hezekiah. But when his son Manasseh took over, things in the country really turned around and went bad. Manasseh brought in idolatry and wickedness and the heart of the entire nation seemed to change. You know, leadership is so important today. Dads, it's important in a family. It's important in business, in our schools, in our churches, in our government, in our nation. When Manasseh's son Ammon took over, the nation followed the wickedness of his heart. It's been said, as goes the leadership, so goes the nation. And when Ammon was assassinated, his son Josiah became king. He turned to the Lord and he tried to bring spiritual reform to the nation. But the majority of the people just weren't having it. So now enters Zephaniah. And he recognized that evil in his day was crying out for justice and for truth. But it's not enough to just change the laws of a country. And that's what Josiah tried to do. Ultimately, people's hearts need to change as well. And I think as Christians, we can fall into the trap of thinking that what our country really needs today is just more Christian political leaders so we can get more Christian laws passed. And there may be some truth and value in this, but that's not the real answer. What our country needs, what America needs, is the hearts of the people to change. And that happens one person at a time. It happens right here. If we change the laws of the country without changing the hearts of the people, all you do is to force people to do something that they don't want to do. But if nations change and individuals change within their heart, people turn back to God. And we'll see things start to go in the right direction as the hearts of people change. Back to Zephaniah chapter 1, 2 through 7. This is what God's saying here he will do because the nation of Judah had turned their backs on him. I, this is God, I'll completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove birds of the sky and fish of the sea. And the ruins along with the wicked, and I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. And the names of the idolatrous priests. You see, even the priests in Judah were going bad. Those that were supposed to be God's spokesmen, they weren't doing it. 
along with the priests, verse 5, and those who bow down on the footsteps of the host of heaven, and those who bow down and they swear to the Lord, yet, and yet swear by Malcolm. So they were trying to worship the God of heaven and earth, Yahweh, and they were trying to worship another God as well. Verse 6, and those who have turned back from following those and those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Just a quick heads up here. The day of the Lord always speaks of the day of God's judgment. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Zephaniah's day, in his day, there was an attitude of arrogance and invincibility within the air. Disaster was the farthest thing from everyone's mind. I mean, a good king was on the throne. The nation was growing. The Assyrians were no longer a threat. Then Zephaniah pierced their complacency with a shocking doomsday message that I read for you once, but I want you to see it again in verse 2. I will completely remove all things. From the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And this was no hysterical, the sky is falling kind of threat. The same God that created the world, in a word, could destroy it if he wanted to. And one day, God, God will, in his future judgment. And we see a picture of that in Second Peter, if you'll go there. Chapter 3, 7 through 13. Kind of makes you think a little bit about where we're at today. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. It's, um, I think, verse 8, Mike may have brought up to you last week. And I'm trying to think, I think it was in, uh, in Awanas and TNT last Wednesday night. One of the young people brought up this verse. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. And the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Isn't that amazing? He's waiting for more to come. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord, we've already talked about that. Remember, it's a day of judgment. Will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed with burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to this promise, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell. Okay, it's against this grim apocalyptic backdrop that Zephaniah sets the stage for Judah's fast and approaching day of judgment. And deep within every human heart, I think we can resonate with a prophet here. Whether you're a believer in God or the Bible or not. Because I think mankind to some degree wants justice. It's why we've created our courts of law. They are supposed to judge crimes, atrocities, and protect a society. On some level, we want to see evil judged. Romans 2.6 says, God will render to each person according to their deeds. Where do you think you got your sense of justice from? 
I think we got it from our creator, God. Verse 4, Zephaniah chapter 1, Baal was the god of the Canaanites. You see, they, they wanted God on one hand, but they also wanted Baal. Malcolm, verse 5, was another name for Moloch, the god of the Amorites, which I won't go into it. I've heard Mike explain it to you in the past, so have I. He was an awful, awful idol. There were people then, just as they were today, that thought they could follow Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and other gods as well. When God wants us to follow him and no other. Other religions, other gods will only lead to hurt and confusion. Let me tell you something this morning that may not be politically correct, but it's true. And this truth has never changed. Not all roads lead to heaven. There is only one. And Jesus talked about this in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, and I could probably quote it for you, but I want you to see it for yourself. Your eyes need to see it. So if you'd go there. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. People today don't want to be told that there's only one way to heaven, but Jesus made it very clear that he was the only way, the only truth, and the only life. The day of the Lord that Zephaniah spoke of, verse 7, in chapter 1, he'll use now more than 19 times in his book. And again, it speaks of the day of God's judgment. And here within the book of Zephaniah, it has a double meaning. First, in Zephaniah's near future and the people of Judah, it would speak of the Babylonians taking Judah into captivity and wiping out the city of Jerusalem. Ultimately, the phrase is used to speak of a future and a final judgment of God. In 2 Peter that we just read for you, chapter 2, 7 through 13. That day is still approaching. Verse 7 in chapter 1, if, if you'll go there to Zephaniah, it's a little hard to understand, but the sacrifice here that it speaks of In verse 7, will be the disobedient nation of Judah. They would become the sacrifice. And the guests, well, the guests are the Babylonians. God's judgment is going to come on the nation of Judah. Verses 8 through 11, God's wrath was going to consume the worldly priests. It just makes me think about the the priests in our own country. And I won't go into a lot of detail here. But there's so many places today you can talk about God, but you cannot talk about Jesus Christ. Just like it was in this day. And the Messiah who was to come. We look forward to the lion of the tribe of Judah who's going to come back, Jesus Christ. Those who practice violence, verse 9 of chapter 1, and corrupt merchants. You see, what and who people worship will have an impact on how we view and how we live life. You know, when you're around somebody that is a follower of Jesus Christ. There's an instant bond, isn't there? You all of a sudden know, to some degree, their, their value system. Verses 12 and 13 of chapter 1. 
it will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And I will punish men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. Does that not sound like today? Moreover, their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses, but they will not inhabit them. They will plant vineyards, but they will not drink of the wine. There is no hiding from God, even in the dark. The people of Jerusalem, it says in verse 12, you may want to underline this, but it says they'd become stagnant in spirit. I think there's a lot of believers in America today that are called Christians because Christians are supposed to be good people, but within their hearts, what do you think God sees as he looks across our country? What does he see from us as a church? I think most of us at one time or another have been stagnant in spirit. Stagnant meaning complacent, indifferent. Not passionate about what we believe anymore. At the time Zephaniah wrote this book, everything was going well for the people of Judah. There was a good king that was on the throne, Josiah. The nation was growing. Money was being made. There were no national threats. The people had gotten comfortable. God's not going to do good. He's not going to do evil. Almost sounds like today. Why doesn't everybody just chill out and let's be fine? Reminds me of a ship in which they said that not even God could sink. But it was moving too fast. They had ignored the warnings of icebergs. Even Captain Smith, was over, with over 40 years' experience, seemed complacent. Come on. The Titanic? It was unsinkable. Even after an accident had tore a huge gash in its side, Complacency still prevailed. Many others trusted in the Titanic's watertight compartment. Others mocked at the bulky orange life jackets. I think this tragedy parallels the story of our world today. We would like to think that human ingenuity has made us safe from disaster. Come on, we're Americans. We're too great to fail. There's a crazy guy in Russia right now with his finger close to the button. Under the surface, sin has ripped a gash in humanity's soul. Believe it or not, the world that we are in is sinking. And Zephaniah kept radioing the warning, Babylonian iceberg, Babylonian iceberg. But nobody was listening. Is there any warnings that are going off in our lives today? Are we listening? It's made me want to check my own heart. Chapter 2, 1 through 3. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the shaft. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you. Before the day, here it is is again. The day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Verse 3 really spoke to my heart this past week as I studied. I think it's something that we all need to be doing. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day 
of the Lord's anger. Nothing could save the nation of Judah except true repentance. And when we make that decision to seek the Lord, we'll be saved from the day of God's judgment. It's a day that's to come. And ultimately, the Bible says we're saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, 1 and 2. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the tyrannical city. Listen to verse 2. She heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. She did not trust in the Lord. She did not draw near to God. Jerusalem's greatest enemy was herself. And she crumbled internally because sin is toxic. You see, long before the Babylonians ripped through her towers and went through her gates, she wasn't seeking the Lord. She wasn't trusting in the Lord. She'd grown complacent. Has Zephaniah's book tried to warn you of anything personally or nationally? Where are we putting our trust? I think it's time that we as Christians stood up and judged what Jesus said was wrong and what he said was evil. Because it's not all fine. As Christians, we need to stand up for what we believe while we still can. Because the day of the Lord is coming. Do I believe it's coming? With every fiber of my being. It's coming. He's a God of love. But he's also holy and he's just. And his judgment is going to come on those who do not believe. Is there really such a place as hell? There absolutely is. If you're looking for truth, and there is such a thing as absolute truth, you will find it in Jesus Christ. He says he was truth, the way and the life. And the only way to the Father, the only way to heaven would be through him. So this morning, I'd ask you to look in your hearts. It's where the Holy Spirit of God looks. And he tests us all. And if you this morning have heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. As we go to prayer, tell him you believe. Tell him that you don't want to be stagnant any longer. Ask for his help in standing up for truth. And the truth that you teach your little ones. The truth that you live by. People where you work need to hear the truth. Somebody needs to stand up. Every time I blow it and you blow it, Jesus in heaven stands up for us as he's our intercessor. He stands up to the Father. And he says, no, Father, I died for Dan. I died for Linda. I died for Jess. I died for Don. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who's in heaven. But if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. We 
We need to stand up for truth. We need to thank him this morning for our freedom. And we need to earnestly pray for those who are fighting and dying for theirs. Because when free men and women are fighting for the right to live and for their freedoms, it's an attack on democracy and free men wherever we may be. Right now, we have some dear missionaries. that are warriors for the kingdom. And he's there with his sons. He hasn't left. And we need to pray for him. His sons are Daniel and Philip. I'm not exactly sure how they're ministering right now or what they're doing. But knowing them, they're warriors for the kingdom and for democracy. So we need to pray for them and for that country. And another man that I'm trying to get to know, President Valinsky. who I believe is a real leader. We need to pray for him. He didn't load up a jet, fill it full of gold and millions and take off and leave. He's there with his people, fighting for freedom. The Bible says, my father-in-law brought out to me the other night in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that we need to pray for kings and leaders and those who are in authority over us. I think we need to pray for our president. Regardless of what you think of him, we need to pray for Putin. God is the one who hardens hearts and God is the one that softens hearts just like he did with Pharaoh. And God can do whatever he wants here. Reminded me of what David said in Psalms chapter 2. The the nations are making an uproar. They are today. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. He's appointed his anointed one. And he will one day come and he will rule with a rod of iron. And that's what we're looking forward to. Jesus Christ coming. But for right now, we can do one of the most powerful things in all the world. We can pray. And God will listen to the prayers of the saints. By the way, before you start praying for our nation's leaders and the freedom fighters in Ukraine, pray for what's going on within the kingdom of your own heart where the Holy Spirit looks. If you've been stagnant, just kind of in neutral, going no place, ask the Lord to forgive you. Tell Him you believe. Put your trust in Him. He's still in control. But as I said earlier, it happens one heart, one person at a time. So you go to prayer. Let's just give the Lord a little bit of our time. Start here. And then I'll come up and close this in just a couple minutes.
Lord Jesus, I pray for my own heart <clears throat> and the hearts of the people that you've brought to Eagle Point Community Bible Church. I pray that our hearts wouldn't be stagnant or complacent, but that our trust would be in you. Not our health, which is fleeting, or our wealth, which is fleeting, or the security of where we live, <clears throat> but it would be in you. The God who created us, that gave us life, in the air we breathe, our Creator and our Savior in you, Jesus, who came to die for our sin. Thank you for the freedom that we have in you. Thank you for the freedom that we have in this country to come and worship you. And right now, Lord, we pray for the people of Ukraine the moms, dads, the grandmas, the grandpas, and the kids that are fighting for their freedom. Oh God, do what only you can do. Do what you're famous for. As you will, in the name of Jesus, and help us to remember that this is just the beginning Pray for Vitalik and Marina. I think they're apart right now. And their sons. And their safety. And that the weak would be strong. I pray for our president, his cabinet. For good generals. Godly counsel. And some backbone. Sometimes, Lord, my heart's probably not where it should be for those that are in try trying to invade Ukraine. And I don't know whether to pray for a, a heavy hand or just a change of heart. So I pray your will in Jesus' name because you know what's best. We, your people, pray your kingdom would come. And your will would be done on earth as in heaven. We pray your glory. We pray you'd use us to make a difference right where we live. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'd hear the prayer of the saints for our own hearts, for our own nation, and for those that are fighting for their freedom and those that we love that are there. Their, their courage inspires our hearts, Lord. Make them strong. Jesus name amen. Let's stand together and worship our mighty Lord Jesus. Crucified for our 
your salvation. So incredible, indescribable God, Jesus Christ, Lord. Father, how you brought us through. 
When deep were the wounds and dark was the night, the promise of your love you proved. Now every battle still to come, let this be our song. It is well, it is well with, my soul. with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Weeping may come, remain for a night, but joy will paint the morning sky. You're there in the fast, you're there in the feast, your faithfulness will always shine. Now every battle still to come, let this be our song. name it is what a beautiful name it is 
the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is the name Christ my King What a wonderful name it is Nothing compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no Praise you, great God. We exalt your name, Jesus. Lord, we pray that when you come for your church, you won't find a church that is lukewarm, but one that is fired up, loves you, is willing to stand up for what you told us to stand up to, one that's confessing you before men as the way, the truth, and the life. Use us, Lord, in this little town of Eagle Point in southern Oregon, to make a difference, to bring revival where we live. And God, 
We pray for the freedom fighters in Ukraine that you would do what only you can do there. We pray for our leaders. Oh God, may they seek your face. May they fear who you are and know that you're a God that's in control and that can do anything. You're a great God. We put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.